I wake up to the sound of rain tapping against the windows of the studio apartment. In Portland, I share with my wife, Amber, where everything smells faintly of coffee grounds and mildew. A sour tang lingers in the air, a scent I can't place but makes my stomach turn. My phone lies dead next to me on a nightstand. Strange. I could have sworn I plugged in the charger last night. I sit up, rubbing the sleep from my eyes, and the ache in my muscles feels deeper than it should, like I've been lying in the same position for days. My clothes. Yesterday's clothes. Cling to my skin with the stale odor of sweat, as if I've lived in them far too long. The clock reads 10.42 a.m. I never sleep in this late, on a weekday. A cold sense of dread creeps in as I stagger out of bed. My car keys aren't on the hook by the door. My laptop is missing from the desk. I shuffle toward the kitchen, each step heavy, like my body's forgotten how to move. As I round the corner, our dog, Baxter, stands in the middle of the room, stiff tail low, hackles raised. His lips peel back, exposing teeth in a way I've never seen before. Bax? Hey, buddy. My voice cracks. He growls low and guttural, like I'm someone he's never met. His eyes, usually soft and eager, are wild now, tracking my every movement, a predator sizing me up. Come on, it's me. I take a cautious step forward, but he lunges, snapping the air just inches from my hand. I stumble back, heart hammering. The worst part isn't the aggression, it's the look in his eyes. There's no recognition. None. I barely manage to sidestep as Baxter snaps again, teeth clicking shut with a sharp clack. My heart races, and I grab the doorknob with trembling hands, wrenching it open just in time. I stumble out into the hallway, slamming the door behind me as his paws scrape furiously against the wood. When I get to the curb outside, my car is gone. Panic hums under my skin as I jog to the wet streets toward my office building downtown. The rain clings to me like a second skin, but I barely feel it. My pulse hammers in my ears. Something's wrong. Everything's wrong. At the office entrance, I swipe my badge. The little beep sounds, but the turnstile won't budge. I try again, but nothing happens. The security guard at the front desk eyes me. Can I help you? He asks, polite but wary. Yeah, I... I clear my throat. I work here. Daniel Clark. Marketing. The guard frowns and types something into his computer. He squints at the screen, then back at me. Says here Daniel Clark already checked in. About 30 minutes ago, the room tilts. My heart skips a beat. What? The guard looks concerned. Look, man, he says carefully, like he's trying not to spook me. You okay? You want me to call someone? I push past him before he can finish. I need to get upstairs. He calls out after me, but I'm already in the elevator, jabbing the button for the 11th floor. Each second that ticks by feels like a countdown to something inevitable and awful. The door opens with a chime, and I step into the familiar buzz of the open concept office. Phones ringing, keyboards clacking, and then I see him. He's sitting at my desk, typing away with an easy, practice smile. He glances up casually, and for a second, my brain short circuits. Because the man in my chair, the one joking with Jason from accounting, drinking from my coffee mug and wearing my watch, is me. No, not exactly. He's better. His jawline is sharper. His skin is clearer. His clothes fit perfectly. Not rumpled or wrinkled like mine. Even his hair, always a little limp no matter what I do, is thick and swept back like he just walked off a photo shoot. He's me without the flaws. Jason claps him on the shoulder with a grin. Congrats again, man. That promotion's long overdue. My stomach twists. The promotion, my promotion, the one I'd been grinding for, sacrificing weekends, working overtime, skipping dinners with Amber, just to prove I was good enough. 
Thanks, bro. The imposter's voice is smooth and warm. Like mine, but without the hesitation to doubt. I step forward, my voice trembling with anger. Hey, get the fuck out of my chair. The room falls silent. Heads turn. Every eye in the office locks on me, and for a moment, nobody moves. Jason shifts uncomfortably. A few co-workers whisper to each other, casting uneasy glances in my direction. The other me tilts his head and smiles, cool, calm, and collected. Sorry, do I know you? Something snaps inside me. I slam my hands down on the desk. I am Daniel Clark. That's my desk. You fucking fraud. Jason steps in front of him, his expression tight with confusion and just a little bit of fear. Hey, buddy, he says, his tone low and careful. I don't know who you are, but you need to leave. Right now. Before we call security. I open my mouth to protest, but two guards are already behind me, hands clamping around my arms. The pity on everyone's faces as they watch me being hauled away burns like acid in my chest. They drag me out, toss me into the cold rain, and slam the door shut behind me. I sit there for a moment on the slick pavement, stunned, the rain washing over me. People pass by without a glance, just another nobody on the street. I dig through my pockets, fingers trembling, and pull out my wallet. My driver's license is gone, replaced by a blank plastic card. No name, no photo, no address, just empty space where I used to exist. I don't go straight home. For the next two hours, I wander the streets in the rain, my coat soaked through, searching for answers. I call my cell service provider from a payphone, but my number has already been transferred to a new device. My bank... Same story. A new password was set this morning, and they won't tell me more without proper ID. I try calling Amber. No answer. I dial twice more, straight to voicemail. At first, I think I've been hacked, but nothing fits. How'd they get my face? My voice? My fucking memories? I head to the police station next, but as soon as I tell them someone stole my life, and that person looks and sounds exactly like me. The officer at the desk gives me this look. Like I'm unstable. Like I'm a problem. Underscore, 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 underscore. When I finally circle back home, the door to the apartment won't budge. My key isn't on me. And the doormat where we keep a spare is empty. I bang on the door, calling for Amber, but she doesn't answer. I circle the building, drenched, heart racing. The fire escape on the side, our usual shortcut when we forget our keys, is still there. One of the windows is cracked open, just enough to squeeze through. I haul myself up, the metal ladder groaning under my weight. My wet clothes stick to the rust, but I don't care. I just need to get inside. I need to see Amber. She'll know what's going on. She has to. I slide the window up and pull myself in, landing awkwardly on the hardwood. As I reach the hallway leading to the bedroom, I hear it a low, rhythmic groan. My pulse stutters. I creep forward, trying not to make a sound. The door to our bedroom is ajar, light spilling from the crack. I push it open with trembling fingers. I know what I'm going to find before I see it. The bedroom smells of sweat and exertion, a scent so thick I gag on it. My wife, Amber, lies sprawled across the bed, glowing with satisfaction. Her dark hair is a wild tangle against the pillows, and she's breathing in short, happy gasps, the kind I haven't heard from her in a long time. At the foot of the bed, he kneels between her legs. My face, my body, my voice, murmuring something low and soft. He wipes his mouth still hard and grins when he sees me standing in the doorway. He doesn't even bother covering himself. Amber lets out a dazed, satisfied laugh. Oh my God, Dan, that was, you've never done that before. She shivers, her skin flushed and glowing. What got into you? I step forward, 
trembling. Amber, her head snaps toward me, and the joy drains from her face, replaced by confusion, then fear. She pulls the sheet over her body, like I'm a stranger who just broke in. Who the fuck are you? She whispers, her voice sharp with panic. My throat tightens. It's me. It's Daniel. I'm your husband. Her eyes dart to the other me. The perfect me. The better me. And I see the moment her confusion dissolves into certainty. She presses herself closer to him, trembling. Dan, call the police. He gets off the bed slowly, lazily, like he has all the time in the world. It's okay, babe, he murmurs, brushing her hair from her face. He's just confused. He turns to me, still smiling that infuriating, perfect smile. But you need to leave now. This isn't your life anymore. I stagger backward, heart hammering, the walls closing in around me. No, no, you're the fake. You're the fucking fake. Amber sobs, burying her face in his chest. He wraps his arms around her, comforting her, owning her, and something inside me crumbles. She clings to him the way she hasn't clung to me in years, like he's the man she's always wanted, and maybe, deep down, the man I could never be. I turn slowly, my legs heavy, each step pulling me further away from everything I thought I knew. The rain greets me again as I step out into the street, cold and relentless, washing over me like a final, indifferent goodbye. I feel like I'm falling, spinning, untethered from reality. Maybe I'm the fake. Maybe I've always been. Or worse, maybe I just never deserved this life to begin with. And now, someone better has taken it.